The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It can be hard to face the fact of how Canada has treated Indigenous people. It can also eclipse the depth and richness of Indigenous culture. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Tonight, to wrap our first week featuring conversations from our archives, we return to the insights of writer and thinker Thomas King on how arts opens a different path for expression and understanding. Also, we'll check in with our Ontario hubs to find out about the restoration of the Silver Island General Store. After his novel, The Back of the Turtle, came out, host Pia Chattopadhyay spoke to author Thomas King in the summer of 2015. King is noted as one of the most influential writers and scholars of his generation. A reminder that 2015, a commonly accepted term for Indigenous people, was Aboriginal, so you will hear that term in this conversation. Last year, Thomas King was awarded the 2021 Stephen Leacock Medal for Humour. Here is Pia's conversation with him from 2015. Some authors would set this kind of novel in a futuristic, maybe sort of a, a dystopian, a post apocalyptic mm. a, 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 I can't say that word. Apo apocalyptic, thank you, setting, thank you. <laughs> Choose the words better, Pia. Um, to talk about contemporary issues. Yeah. Um, th I don't know, the road, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, if you think about it. Yeah. Why do you want to set your novel in present day? Uh, because I don't have to run to the future to uh, find uh, apocalyptic fiction. Thank you for helping me again. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, some of the things that are happening right now uh, could be happening in the future. I don't have to go to the future to find those things. Mm. Uh, they come to me, so it's it's it's, it's pretty easy. And besides, uh, if I try to create uh, a future. Uh, I don't know how I would do that. My, one of my, my oldest boy is a science fiction uh, fan, and he's told me I should write some science fiction. It sells really well. You turn it into movies, you make a million dollars. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know what a world would look like, and this one scares me enough already. I don't have to go to the future to, uh, to worry myself any more than I do. And as you said it in the present day, um, and we talked a little bit about this y yesterday as well, about you don't, you don't have intention of telling me what to think, but were you um, trying to draw any parallels to a specific, a recent disaster? Like, in your mind, were you like, I want to tell a story about this, but fictionalize it to some extent? Uh, not so much. I mean, uh, those kinds of events are all around me. Uh, I think I, the other day, mentioned Grassy Narrows and the BP oil spill and the Exxon Valdez and the problem that I think is coming with the tar sands out in Alberta. So I think these things float around me all the time. Uh, I, I don't have to go looking for them. Uh, they arrive on my doorstep uh, and then they disappear just as quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I have that available as storytelling material and so I, I simply use it. And as they arrive on your doorstep, there is no humor in these things when they happen, right? And yet no. you take the approach of using satire and, and, and humor. Yeah, I think in part, uh, I've, I've always said that humor was, a, uh, was an aboriginal uh, survival strategy. Uh, to look at something and find the humor in it or find the satire in it, to find that moment wh where it's so ludicrous and so awful that it, it actually is, is kind of funny. Mm. Uh, and I think we, we need that. When I write, if I'm writing about something that's very, very tragic, I always try to put some humor in it because I think that that little bit of humor deepens the tragedy. And I think a little bit of tragedy sharpens the humor. You say this is, what did you say, an aboriginal a sort of coping strategy. I mean, where does that sort of emerge from? Well, I mean, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got 400 years of, uh, of Europeans uh, having at Native people in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, certainly with, uh, with my tribe, uh, we were re removed from uh, Georgia and the Carolinas and just shipped off to uh, what was then Indian Territory, what is now Oklahoma. And we lost about 25 percent 
of our population on those forced marches that uh, took us out there, lost our homeland, basically. If humor is sort of this coping mechanism that has long existed to, 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 to deal with tragedy and, and mm -hmm. colonialism and, and uh, you know, disaster. All those nasty -isms. All those nasty -isms, yeah. Um, I wonder, because we see this with a lot of um, Aboriginal First Nations artists, that they, they talk about the stories and these calamities that, that ha have descended upon them. And yet, there is always hope and there is always opportunity. Let me ask you this, Thomas. Do you think that um, if you were, if you, you know, came out sort of angry, like an angry Aboriginal writer, do you think you'd be taken less seriously differently? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I was that early on in my career, not as a writer, but as an activist. And uh, I would go on television and radio uh, just, you know, banging my fist down, getting really angry. I was in, uh, I was in Chico, California, uh, and there was a Mohawk guy and myself who started the first Native organization on that campus. And we had a we had some kind of an event where there was myself and, uh, and, uh, and, and Richard Glazier and then two people from the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the States. And we were on a panel and we did our bit, which was fairly angry. I don't know if Richard was actually there, but I did my bit. I was very, very angry. And uh, the two BIA people put up their pie charts and uh, their graphs to show how things had gotten better for Native people. And afterwards, uh, and I had done this for a while, this kind of shtick that I did. And then afterwards, we came off the stage, and the woman who had uh, invited us there, uh, the two BIA guys came off the stage first, and so she shook their hand and handed them an envelope, and shook their hand and handed them an envelope. And I turned to Richard, and I said, hey, you know, look at that. You know, I knew what that was. That was an honorarium check. So we get there, and she shakes our hands, but no envelopes. And I said, you know, I said, wait a minute. I said, what was in the envelope you gave the two BIA guys? And she says, well, that, that was an honorarium. I says, well, where's ours? And she says, well, and she was embarrassed. And she says, well, after all, they're the experts. And I said, what are we, the entertainment? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was. When I was ranting and raving and, you know, pounding the table and being that uh, sort of, you know, hardcore uh, activist with uh, just one one note, you know, which was angry, uh, people were dismissing me. But they, they wanted to come to see the angry Indian, you know, s watch him shout, watch him jump around, you know, film at 11 kind of thing. And I learned very early on that I did not want to be entertainment, that I wanted to get to people. And one of the ways to do that was through humor. Because if you were humorous, they'd let you in. And by the time they discovered that that was a really bad idea, it was much too late. <laughs> it was sort of like getting very close and sort of nicking mm. people. So uh, it's, it's easier to talk about serious things if you, can, if you can add a little bit of humor in there to make it more palatable. But if you're just in their face, you know, 24-7, whack, 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 whack. Mm. I haven't seen where that does a lot to change minds. In terms of uh, broadly culturally as an activist, or is there a distinction if you're an angry Indian versus an angry something else? No, I think it's, I think it's angry anything. Uh, as I, I look to see uh, the people who have uh, concerns about particular issues, everything from cruelty to animals to uh, energy extraction to the way in which corporations manage their business, uh, the G8 summit protest. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, that, that really hard core anger uh, doesn't, I, I think it turns people off mm. in the end. I think it turns the general population off. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but just as I watch it and watch people's reaction to this, uh, I mean, when the when uh, the when the when the G8 uh, protests were up, the, the concern was over property. My God, of all the issues that are important in that whole debate, property, private property, was it going to be injured? Uh, you know, the world is plummeting towards uh, some kind of an Armageddon, and they're worried about property uh, damage. But there it is. So that's that's the North American. Mm -hmm. Uh, paradigm. Hmm. I want to read, um, read you something. It was Jeff Simpson, the Globe Mail columnist, uh, wrote an op-ed uh, spring about the state of relations between First Nations people and the rest of Canada. Yeah. It's a bit of a lengthy quote, so just bear with me here. Sure. Here's what Jeff Simpson wrote. Okay. 
Statistics Canada told us following its 2006 survey that there were 612 bans and more than 2,600 reserves. People have been voting with their feet, as they say, since Stats Canada estimates that only 40% of First Nations people live on reserve, a share that has been slowly dropping for some time. More than 60% of these bands, or quote, nations, as they choose to call themselves, have fewer than 1,000 people. Jeff Simpson goes on to say this. Given the demographic, it is, it is reasonable to ask whether nations of fewer than 1,000 people is an oxymoron. It is certainly a rhetorically powerful idea, but in reality, what does it mean? On some reserves I have visited, visited, I have asked myself, could a group of 500 or 700 PhDs make this territory economically viable and deliver services expected by a self-governing group? That's what Jeff Simpson wrote in April of this year. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get your thoughts, Thomas King. Is the Aboriginal population, as Jeffrey Simpson suge might suggest, too small to be viable, to be self-governing? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we've got to back up to some of the assumptions that are a part of that. Uh, one is that that ignores the kind of uh, destruction that Canadian governments and U.S. governments have wreaked on Native people to begin with. Uh, certainly, we were nations. Uh, and we've been slowly starved out of existence. Uh, we've been pushed off the reserves. The reserves themselves have been strangled. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, if, you, if you looked at it as a business plan, it's a pretty crappy business plan. The little line would go just right on down to the bottom there. Now, we've tried to stop that from happening. Uh, the fact that we're losing uh, population on the reserve isn't that the reserves aren't viable. It's the thing. It's it's the problem that uh, the reserves have to be economically viable, and the government every step of the way has tried to stop that from happening. Uh, so, are they nations? Well, here's the, here's the thing about sovereignty and nationhood: is you take that on yourself. Somebody else doesn't do it for you. I don't come along and say to the Mohawk, for instance, you're a, you're a nation, you're a sovereign nation, or you're not. The Mohawk take that on for themselves, whether they're 5,000 people, 50,000 people, or 500 people. That's something that you do as a group. We're in 2015, and I'm wondering, Thomas, I mean, do you think we've gotten any wiser over the years about how we approach these these challenges and these yeah. misunderstandings? I had a, I wrote a, I write, write poetry and nobody knows about this. Uh, one of the lines from one of my poems was, uh, uh, tell me who was left to hate. Surely there was someone new, someone missed the first time through. And I look at Canada and the US and uh, I, I, I chuckle when racism comes up as a topic because it's kind of a revolving thing. Right now, uh, the uh, people who are in the crosshairs of that uh, social political canon are uh, Muslims and anybody, brown people with beards. But uh, in my lifetime, that canon's been aimed at, uh, at blacks, at Asians, at Latinos, uh, at native people, at gays, can you spell Indiana and Arkansas, uh, at the disabled. Uh, we seem to have to have somebody that we dislike. Um, let's talk about reconciliation. Okay. okay. What does it mean to you and is it possible between non-Aboriginal people and Aboriginal people? I, I, I don't know if I believe in the concept of reconciliation as it plays out in the media. Uh, what I'm looking for is a, a more, what they used to call a level playing field for Aboriginal people in, in, in North America. Uh, I would like the federal governments to get off the backs of the bands. Uh, that, that great joke about when, uh, when Idle No More uh, was up and running and the first thing they did was to begin looking at some of the chief's salaries and their expense accounts when Ottawa was wallowing in, in uh, pork belly, uh, what we used to call pork belly, uh, machinations. Uh, uh, I would, 
prefer to move the conversation from reconciliation to, you know, how can we make uh, reserve land more viable for Native people? Uh, how can we support uh, those groups, uh, the various bands? Uh, you know, how can we start to help get uh, economic development uh, going on uh, some of the reserves. Uh, that will go further to helping Aboriginal people than uh, spending a lot of time on reconciliation because quite frankly some of the things that were done to Aboriginal people uh, are unfor unforgivable mm. and I think uh, they're not going to be forgiven particularly and we're just going to have to live with that and move beyond. There's, there's this notion that if you say you're sorry, then things are all right. But there are some, there are some insults uh, that you, know, you just can't say I'm sorry and, and move past. I think that's what you're seeing. I think Native people are saying, okay, let's see if we can't get together, but we're not gonna forget that. Mm. We're not gonna forget what we've done to our grandparents and our parents. We're not going to forget the kind of effects that it's had on us. And uh, we're going to try to work around it. But don't expect we're going to stand up at some point in time and say, OK, you know, we love you. Let's, let's get moving. It's a pretty difficult um, point to make, though, that we're sort of. Well, I mean, I, uh, that's me, OK. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's difficult for me to hear to say, so it's sort of intractable forever in a, in, a, in a way. Well, I think that I don't know if it's forever, but if you continue to do the same things, I mean, one of the things that I point out in uh, The Inconvenient Indian is that the history that we lived with for 500 years is the same history that we have today, that the policies that were brought in, put in place in the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s are the same policies that are currently in place. They look a little different. We've changed them around somewhat, but the basic attitudes are exactly the same. It was one of the, one of the surprises that I found out when I wrote the book was that that history that I thought was in the past really was right here with us in the present. And that hasn't changed. Until that changes, there can be no reconciliation, I don't think. Um, thank you. You say, keep, kept saying you're, the her you're a hermit. I'm glad you left your hermit kingdom and came, came to yeah, talk no, to me. Yeah, no, I'll run back to it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Pleasure. If Sleeping Giant Provincial Park is on your to-do list as Ontarian staycation this year, you won't want to miss the newly restored local hub known as the Silver Islet General Store. Our Northwestern Ontario Hub journalist Sharnell Anderson visited and she joins us now from Red Rock on the north shore of Lake Superior with details. Hey Sharnell. Hi Dan. All right, so can you give us an idea of where Silver Islet is and what it's known for? Yeah, so if you're in Thunder Bay and you look out towards Lake Superior, you'll see the Sleeping Giant. And so that's actually located on what's called Sibley Peninsula, which is um, just west of the city. Um, and so uh, Silver, Island, Silver Island is actually tucked behind the Sleeping Giant on the Sibley Peninsula. And um, in the mid 1800s, uh, prospectors in the area discovered silver. And so they acquired that land, or a company called Montreal Mining Company acquired that land and they tried to develop it. But it was really challenging because it was a small land mass at the time and the silver, they essentially had to go under Lake Superior in order to access the silver. Um, so they tried for about two years and the company, they're just like, no, this is an engineering nightmare. <laughs> and uh, so they ended up selling the rights to the land to a gentleman named um, Alexander Sibley and his company, uh, Silver Islet Mining Company. And so Sibley was able to develop the land. Um, and so they ended up expanding uh, the island actually almost 10 times its original size using crushed rock. Um, they also built wooden breakwaters around it to try and protect it from the lake. Um, they built a number of other things too. Uh, they built a lighthouse, uh, a bunch of houses for miners and their families. They even built a jail there. So it was really a whole kind of community that they built. The mine operated throughout the 1870s and the 1880s. And um, they excavated over $3 million worth of silver, and it came to be known as the richest silver mine in the world um, until it ceased operations in 1884 because they ran out of coal. And so the coal was used to power the pumps to keep the water out of the mine shafts. Uh, so the, when they ran out of the coal, the pumps failed, and Lake Superior reclaimed the mine. 
so most people abandoned the area after that, except for a gentleman uh, named James Wilmington Cross. He was uh, a former care, uh, a former captain who kind of became the island's caretaker. And um, over time, uh, most of the miners' shacks were sold to cottagers, and it kind of became a summer um, cottage community, which is how it remains today. Now, I understand one of the other structures that's kind of remained there was the general store, and it had a very different use in the 1800s. What exactly was that? Mm. So as the mining company was kind of uh, developing the land and establishing this community, they built a warehouse, as you mentioned. And so that's where the miners would go and pick up their gear. So stuff like uh, pick pickaxes or clothing, boots, hard hats, uh, stuff like that. But, you know, of course, after all the miners left, uh, this warehouse full of mining equipment wasn't really useful anymore. And uh, so the cross, as I mentioned, uh, who became the island's caretaker, his family kind of took over um, all the uninhabited properties that were left behind, including the warehouse. And uh, they eventually turned that into what is now the general store. Uh, tell us about the family. Uh, I understand, you know, this island, this, you know, islet has a very rich history. It also has an interesting story there as well. What do we need to know about them? Yeah, so there's um, a couple of different family histories here. So I just mentioned the Cross family um, who turned the warehouse into the general store. And so uh, the general store kind of stayed within their family for a few generations. Uh, by the 1980s, it was owned by a gentleman named Sid Halter, who was actually married to Cross's granddaughter, Fia Cross. And um, so the current owner, who his name is Jeff Corkola, he owns it alongside with his wife, Sandy. He kind of explained all this to me. And um, so how they came into it. So Sandy uh, has had a brother named Moore. Uh, his name is Lawrence Saxberg, and he was actually an anchor for the CBC for a while. Uh, sadly, he died in an accident in 2006. Um, but the first time Lauren saw Silver Islet, he was out there doing some filming and he fell in love with the place because, <laughs> I mean, it was really not hard to do. Um, and so after that, Lauren inquired uh, about the property and eventually uh, in the late 1980s, uh, the Saxburg family bought it from the Cross family. And uh, so the Saxburgs ran it for a while. So that would be Sandy and Lauren's parents. Um, but of course, as, happen as it happens, uh, they got older and they were no longer able to um, keep up with it. Uh, so they put it up for sale and it was on the market for a few years. There was some interest, but they didn't end up selling it. So they took it off the market. And eventually the stars kind of aligned, allowing Jeff and Sandy to buy it. So keeping it in the family. Now, uh, you, as you mentioned, you spoke to Jeff and I actually want to uh, show some pictures. This is sort of, you know, he has big plans for this. This is actually a photo of the before. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yeah, so it's a photo of a photo, and I'm not entirely sure when the original photo was taken, um, but if you look really closely, you can kind of see people uh, around the building. And on top of the building there, there was actually a platform. And so Jeff explained to me that was called the Widow's Walk. You would access that from inside the building. There were barrels full of water on top, um, which could be emptied uh, in case of fire. So that was kind of their fire safety plan at the time. You know, that uh, the, <laughs> there's a lot of wood in that building, so they needed to do something. Now, I do want to show a photo of what it looks like now. A bit of a nice little refresh there. Mm -hmm. So I took that photo uh, when I went to Silver Islet in June, and that's kind of the front entrance when you pull up. The first thing you notice is really the blue exterior, right? Um, that's kind of come become synonymous with the general store, in my mind at least. And um, as I understand it, I think they're going to kind of honor that and keep it the same blue color. The work that's been done to sort of, uh, you know, renew this area all kind of started with some dock work that was actually quite necessary in order for this all to happen. What do we need to know about that? Yeah, so actually a big part of this, which uh, I think, you know, luckily uh, Jeff and Sandy didn't have to do themselves, was repairing the dock out front in the harbor because that dock was over 100 years old. It was made of timber. It's on Lake Superior. So you can imagine, you know, the kind of shape it was in. And uh, by 2013, it was actually condemned by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, and so of course that was a big problem because this is big, expensive infrastructure. Um, but what ended, up, what ended up happening was uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans tore it out and they replaced it with a concrete top dock, which actually my dad worked on. He's an iron worker, so he helped build that. Mm. Um, and then they also uh, repaired the breakwater in the harbor and repositioned the boat launch. So they did a lot of this work that kind of allowed uh, Jeff and Sandy to do the work that they're doing now. 
Now, of course, we're still in a pandemic and a lot of people have started to do pandemic projects. This seems to be uh, quite the big project here. Uh, what have they done so far to spruce it up? Yeah, it's a pretty ambitious pandemic project because like I took up gardening, so <laughs> it's not the same. Um, but yeah, you know, as Jeff was giving me a tour, I was kind of thinking about what it means to renovate this 150 year old building because that's been standing there, you know, longer than you or I or him, any of us have been alive. So I asked him if that was kind of an intimidating feat for him. And he said, yeah, it was intimidating, but they also knew that it was doable, right? It's the kind of thing when you break it down into chunks, it becomes more manageable. Um, and they've come a long way. So, so far they've repaired the chimney. Um, they redid the roof. Uh, so they put a steel roof on there, which is really durable, but it can be ugly. But what they've done is used um, their steel shingles. So it kind of looks like, um, you know, your standard shingles. Uh, it looks really good. Um, and they've also replaced the windows. Uh, they're working on plumbing and electrical, which is important because this area is actually all off grid. Uh, so what they've done is they've replaced a diesel generator with um, some solar panels. And so that's a lot of the big stuff that they've done over the last year. And, um, but, you know, Jeff said, this is a kind of project that there's always going to be something to do, you know, they're never going to be finished, but they have got a lot of the major stuff done. I actually want to pull up a photo of Jeff. Uh, this is Jeff in the billiards room, uh, and he's quite excited about that, but he's also quite excited about what's going to be happening in the back of the store. You know, there's a saying, business in the front, party in the back. I understand there's some, some, uh, some great uh, kind of initiatives there. Tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, Jeff and Sandy have a pretty strong vision for the store. Uh, you saw Jeff there with the pool table. That's actually um, Alexander Sibley's original pool table. So they're going to have that in the pool room as part of the general store. Um, and then they're also going to have um, like a store with basic supplies and merchandise. Uh, they're going to have a coffee bar so you can go get your cappuccinos. <laughs> um, they're going to serve ice cream and they'll have a little walk up window so you can kind of walk up outside and grab your treats that way. Um, and then at the back, as you mentioned, they're going to be uh, making it a tea room. It has been a tea room in the past. Um, so, you know, they're going to honor that tradition and serve light meals. And they're going to do something called moonlight tea, which is kind of like high tea but at night so i think that'll be really cool some very exciting stuff thank you so much charnel and that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer i'm jay and jaganathan thanks for watching tbo and for joining us online at tbo.org have a good weekend and nam we'll see you again on monday the agenda in the summer with nam kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you thank you for supporting tbo's journalism Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.